much for having me. This is perhaps the most beautiful view I've ever seen at a Rotary Club, and I've speak, spoken at a fair number of Rotary Clubs here in Washington and also in Lima uh, 10 years ago. And now I'm thinking maybe I should be a little pickier when people ask me to come to speak. And say, how's your view? <laughs> this is just gorgeous. I actually went to high school here in Tacoma at Annie Wright um, a few decades ago. Uh, so it's nice to be back. And I'll be at your Rotary District Conference in a couple of weeks with a few Rotarians at a table um, talking about what we do. So that'll be a great chance to, to see you again if you're coming. Um, anyhow, I'm going to talk so I'm from World Possible. And um, you know, starting from the beginning, um, basically we're a nonprofit. We're based in California, but I'm located here uh, in the Northwest. And our mission is connecting offline learners to the world's knowledge. Um, and I'll tell you all. I'd like to tell you just the story of what we do and why we do it. First, though, I couldn't resist sharing a few photos of myself in Lima <laughs> uh, back in 2008. That's near the rotary pins um, in the middle on the left hand side there. And then that's me on the left visiting some, uh, visiting actually a school in a, a slum in the outskirts of Lima. And that was actually where I got really started with my passion for um, helping <laughs> schools in remote areas uh, get access to quality materials and education. I was just so inspired. We visited probably a dozen different schools um, in the whole greater Lima area. Some were very remote on high top mountaintops somewhere in the, these slums outside of Lima where there's almost no infrastructure and they have to carry water for miles. Um, but I was really inspired by the teachers I met there and the students I met and how much passion they had for learning. Um, and that's when I decided I just really wanted to work in education and especially in the international development context. So I've been doing that ever since. Um, and so the reason that World Possible, the whole big problem that we're trying to solve is the fact that 52% of the world's population is offline, which means they don't have access to all the wealth of materials and knowledge that you and I take for granted every day. And those people who are offline are the people who are already marginalized in so many other ways. They're the people who are living in poverty, who often don't have access to quality education or healthcare. And so for us, that is really the, the big problem that we're attempting to solve because we know that access to education and information helps people in so many other ways. It helps them you know, qualify for jobs and access healthcare and learn basic sanitation information. Um, I'm a little bit of a data nerd since I used to work for a research team at UNESCO. So to just throw one little fact at you, um, students, or sorry, children who are born to mothers who can read are 50% more likely to survive past age five. So when I think of education, I think not just of learning to read as this like extra wonderful thing you could have, I think of it as really fundamental to everything we're trying to achieve when, when we can think about international development. Educate, you can't really improve health, sanitation, all these other things without also giving people the knowledge that they need to, to access that information. Um, so we think it's really a matter of urgency to get quality learning to these 52% of the world that's offline. So our story begins in 2008 when that man there, Numberto Mujica, who's originally from Argentina um, and is now has been a long time a Cisco Systems engineer in California. And as part of the Cisco Systems corporate volunteer program, he traveled to Ethiopia and he visited a school um, to teach a class at a university and he found this computer lab and when he got there, nobody had ever used it. It was just a bunch of dusty computers sitting in a room that were full of viruses and had no internet and no information and he thought, I'm a systems engineer, I can solve this problem. And so what he did was he grabbed three of his colleagues from Cisco Systems and they built the earliest version of what we now call Rachel. And I'll tell you a little more and you'll give you a chance to try it out later. Um, but it's basically a little server full of content that can bring information to a whole room full of devices. So they went back in 2009, they brought Rachel and the whole idea for our, our organization was born. And now today, in 2018, uh, we have three solutions. Rachel is our delivery mechanism, but we also have what we call oer to go and we have chapters that help make Rachel more useful in the local context. So I'll talk briefly about each of them. First is oer to go Basically, oer to go is a collection of educational websites, some of which you may have heard of, like Wikipedia and Khan Academy. But we've got 
over a hundred of them that we have modified to work offline. So that basically means like you can get online and connect to Wikipedia and look up anything at any time. We have taken Wikipedia and stored it on this server so that you can bring this anywhere um, and where you can download it from oer2go.org for free and take it on a laptop or a tablet to anywhere in the world. Same with all of these other um, resources. Some of them are large, international, well-known. Some are very small and localized, like for example, information to study for the West African Secondary School examination is on there. Um, some that's speci you know, some is specific to learning, um, <clears throat> learning the most basic subjects like literacy and math and science. Some is more um, specialized like vocational information, agricultural information. There's a whole world of information there. One of our partners said, that said described it as having 10 years worth of educational materials on this server. You could spend a lot of time uh, just learning from what's on here. Um, and so this is the website that we run. It's called oer2go.org. You can search by language. We mainly have English, Spanish, and French, but we are always adding um, more languages as people request certain materials and as materials become available. And what we go do is we just take these openly licensed websites. If they're not openly licensed, we'll get their permission and we'll we basically, our tech team repackages it and makes it into a downloadable free module. So that's the first part of what we do, oer2go.org, and that's our, you know, like the first step for us in making the internet available offline. The second is Rachel, which is basically our delivery mechanism. Um, Rachel stands for Remote Area Community Hotspot for Education and Learning. And it's basically, it's a plug and play server. So it doesn't require an IT person. You just press a button, it emits a Wi-Fi signal, and suddenly your whole room can connect. Um, so it doesn't require any, any internet. You could use it on a boat, in an airplane, at the top of a Himalayan mountain, at a school that takes two hours to, or, you know, two days even to walk to from the nearest road. Really, it goes to the most remote parts of the world. Um, it works with any device that can browse the internet, so that's all laptops, all desktops, all, um, all tablets, and a lot of phones. Um, you can choose to have either 500 gigabytes or a whole terabyte of storage. So that's a ton of information. And it can connect, connect to up to 50 users. The men, about the number of people in this room could connect all at the same time. And we make it really easy for our teachers to add their own content. So if they went to an internet cafe and found a video they wanted their whole class to see, they could upload it to their Rachel. Um, and we sell it for really cheap. We sell for $399 to nonprofits. We're trying to keep that, as we subsidize that to keep it really as affordable as we possibly can. Um, and then for those who are a little more technical, it has an eight hour battery, full server, four gigabytes of RAM, dual band wireless router, that's what makes it work with both really old devices and new devices. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really powerful, it's surprisingly small and lightweight, but it's actually a very powerful little server. So I'll give you a chance to explore that in a few minutes. But quickly I want you to talk about our chapters, because they're very key to what we do. We're actually a very small, lightweight team. We have three staff members in the US. Whenever we get a little extra money, we, we use it to hire somebody to start a chapter because we know that the chapters are so important to everything that we do. Um, to give you, okay, so I'm gonna talk quickly about each chapter. First though, these is just the, the yellow, um, the yellow countries and states here show you are like the known installations of Rachel. So this is all the places that we know of so far where people have brought Rachel. Um, we started our first chapter in Guatemala, and I love this photo because this is a middle school student who learned how to build a drip irrigation system using information that he found on Rachel at his school. And he lives in a community that doesn't have a long farm, doesn't have a lot of rainfall, and so their farming season is quite <laughs> short. And now his community is able to farm for longer because of this agricultural information that he found. Um, our Guatemala team has three staff members. They're totally independent in that they fundraise all of their own money. They have a long history of working with Rotary Clubs in this neighborhood, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but so far, they've done an incredible job of bringing Rachel to about 160 different schools, libraries, and community centers all across the country. They travel for days in this really rugged pickup truck that they have. Um, and they've, um, 
they found teacher training to be a really important part of what they do. So they train teachers who are very used to just talking and, and writing on a whiteboard and asking students to memorize, or not even a whiteboard, usually a chalkboard, to memorize whatever they write down. Um, they train teachers to use the information in racial to have a more interactive classroom. Um, and that's a, a key fundamental shift for a lot where they, for example, would divide their students into groups and um, ask their students to explore a big question and then they go do research on Rachel and they come back and they give presentations. That's something that we probably all grew up with but in Guatemala. It's not the most common way of teaching. So our team is really trying to help instill those, that knowledge and those, those new skills in teachers across the country. And they've done an amazing just such job so far. Um, so that's our first chapter. The second chapter is in Kenya. We have one uh, staff member there. So far, he's brought Rachel to 10,000 students and trained about 100 and 
30 teachers through his own work and through the working with a lot of partners and other NGOs in Kenya um, who he supports. Um, our third chapter is in Sierra Leone, where we have reached over 2,000 students using both static learning labs, so those are learning labs that are always in the same place at a school, and this concept of mobile learning labs that travel from one place, one school to another. So every Monday it goes to the same school and students can explore, then every Tuesday at a different school. And that's pretty incredible because they've had the Ebola crisis and they're also in such a remote region of Sierra Leone that students often have to walk many hours to get to school. So they've done an amazing job despite all of the challenges there. Um, we also surprisingly found a huge demand for Rachel in the US prison system. So our next chapter opened in the United States. Um, and we now have pr uh, Rachel's in prisons in 14 different states where pris uh, prisons want to give their prisoners, who many consider students or potential students, access to knowledge information without the full internet. Um, so we even have a, like, a, a customized version of content for US prisons where we take out all of the content from Wikipedia that's objectionable or for some one reason or another not allowed into the prison system, um, but keep all of the educational content. And prisoners can now even study for and obtain um, course credits using Rachel. Um, so we're hoping that will reduce recidivism um, and encourage people to, to gain the skills they need. Amazingly, 75% of prisoners in the United States are illiterate. So even just teaching basic skills like how to read, how to use a computer, um, we hope will help prisoners be more likely to go out and get jobs um, when they finish their sentence. Um, let's see. And then we're in the process this year. It's really exciting. We just opened a top <coughs> chapter in Tanzania. An amazing woman there who's just an incredible volunteer. She has been an incredible volunteer for a long time. Now she's a staff member. And then you know, starting in June, we'll have a chapter in Ghana with another amazing and just super talented um, young man named Mustafa. Um, so those are our next two chapters, and we're hoping to add a lot more. That's really our plan is to keep adding more chapters over the years. Overall, now we have six chapters, but Rachel has reached 41 countries with the help of our partners, many different NGOs, and Rotary groups buy Rachel from us and take it to lots of different parts of the world. Um, some are large, like USAID and World Vision, and some are really small, just like one person who visited a school in Namibia and decided that they needed a Rachel. Like those, um, there are all kinds of different ways to use it. Um, we have a, last year 134 different groups um, bought Rachel from us, so we consider them partners. And we estimate, it's always hard to tell with offline, we estimate we've reached about 500,000 learners so far. Um, anyhow, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how Rotary has been involved with World Possible. It's because it's actually been a huge part of our success, especially in Guatemala. Um, so first of all, um, the, the first Rotary Club that got involved was the Woodside Portola Rotary Club in California. We started supporting our programs in, in Guatemala. And then in 2014, Bob Kearns from Port Orchard Rotary brought Rachel to Kenya and even had a really cool article in Forbes magazine written about his work um, back in 2014. Um, and that was a huge thing for us, a great thing for Rotary. Um, it's, it's really been wonderful. Bob has been, I don't know how many of you know Bob, but he's been a great, um, a great advocate for Rachel and everything we do. Um, then in, let's see, in just last year, the Gig Harbor Rotary Club started supporting our Guatemala chapter to bring Rachel to more schools. And uh, this year, the Woodside Portola, oh, I guess it's cut off a little bit. Woodside Portola, Gig Harbor, and Port Orchard Rotary are, um, have already have funded an expansion and a really crucial impact study of our work in Guatemala. So currently a group of sixth graders in Guatemala at 12 different schools have been tested for reading and math and we're also looking at teacher skills, like teacher teaching methods. They've already done the baseline test and in the fall we'll find out what impact the, the schools with Rachel um, have over the schools that do not have Rachel. Um, and that will be really helpful because so many foundations ask for proof that your work is impactful and we've just been so busy doing the work that this will be our first time really taking a step back and measuring its impact. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Uh, so uh, coming up, we know that your club is actually planning to bring a Rachel to Namibia. Uh, your international group uh, I met with a few months ago, and I believe they're going in June. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but it, uh, we're really excited that you guys are going there. We, we used to 
used to have a chapter there. Unfortunately, our chapter member has decided, or our chapter leader has decided to go back to school. So we don't currently have a chapter, but we do have lots of Rachel users in Namibia, and it, it's, a, it's a great place to work. Um, and uh, a whole group of Rotary Clubs in Ontario are working with Gig Harbor on a large Rotary Global Grant to, um, to bring Rachel to 50 more schools in Guatemala. And that would be a huge thing um, for our Guatemala team, for Rotary, and just for our partnership to, to, to work together. We're very excited about that. Um, in general, the cost per school for us to bring Rachel, which as I mentioned is about $400, um, plus our, to send our staff to go and train the teachers at school, to bring them Rachel, to install any Chromebooks or other devices that they might be bringing, is anywhere from $650, which I think is so cheap, um, to about 1000 if they have to travel quite a long ways and stay overnight somewhere. Um, and then if we are including, if we're going to schools that don't have any devices, often we recommend starting with five Chromebooks. That way a, a classroom of students can, can all share those Chromebooks, take turns on them, teachers can use them. Um, it's a great way to get a school started. And that costs more like $2,000 um, to bring the Chromebooks or Rachel and train the teachers. Um, so some Rotary Clubs have been funding one school or a handful of schools. And as you saw, some are working together on this big global grant to make a, a really widespread impact in, in Guatemala. Um, so we're really excited about what we can do with, with a fairly small amount of money. And that, um, that applies to all of our chapters, not just in Guatemala, but in any chapter, if you're interested in, say, funding one of our chapters, our chapter in Kenya or Tanzania, to bring Rachel to two or three schools, we can put together a proposal for you easily. So anyhow, um, I'll give you the time uh, to answer questions, but I, I just wanted to let you know that I, I'm so happy to be here and I'm so grateful to everything Rotary has done so far um, in working with us. I think it's making a huge difference. And um, we've already met lots of kids. Our director traveled to Tanzania not too long ago and said, you know, I'm, a, I'm the executive director of World Possible Week for the creators of Rachel. And one of the students said, that he met said, oh, you must be so rich <laughs> because because what they do is so impactful there. And he said, you know, I said, well, not really in the way you're thinking, but yes, I do feel rich, like in having all of this impact um, and, and, and seeing the results of the, the great work we've done. Mm -hmm. um, in any case, I would love to show you how Rachel works. How much time have I got? Yeah, okay, so what I'm gonna do is I just press this button to turn it on, and as you'll see, it lights up and it's blinking. It's cr basically creating a Wi-Fi signal. And I'm gonna use this computer, which I've never used before, but it'll show you, give you a sense of kind of what it takes to connect to Rachel. Um, and hopefully, will it share my screen? Can you this? Oh my goodness, okay. Let's see. I've never had that question before. It usually just does it. Do I have to go hit a, like a screen share? Uh, do function F eight, I think. Function. It doesn't have the F eight line. <coughs> so you got Oh, it. just press function F eight. Yeah, got it. Ah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> if not, if you, might, you can get, bring out your own phone or laptops and and do it on your own. But if I can show you, it'll be faster and easier. Basically, I'll just kind of explain to you the way it works. The way it works is you can take any device and you open up the Wi-Fi, like connecting to a new Wi-Fi signal, which you've probably done it every time you go to an internet cafe or a cafe with internet. And you'll see a signal called Rachel. And you're welcome to try this now on your phone if you want to play along. <laughs> um, and once you connect to it, all you do is, is just connect to it. There's no password. So this is what I would tell all you who are a bunch of students in a rural school who are just connecting for the first time, you open the internet um, connectivity and you connect to Rachel, and then you open a web browser and you just type in this IP address. <coughs> I wish I could show you, but anyhow, it's 192.168.88.1.